Uh, what I have found, even for myself, but especially as I've talked to other people about unit testing in climate community, um, that there's a lot of challenges that we face that are either unique to our community or we perceive them to be unique to our community or um, are just misconceptions about testing. And so this is going to be sort of a summary of what I've gathered from those discussions with other people and some of the things that I've uh, responded in terms of how I think this could be addressed. Some of them I've actually put into practice, but some of them are more wish lists on my part. Okay. Um, I can summarize the four types of issues as the, these first four bullet points here. And again, I've lost my mouse, which is, an, oh, there it comes. Sorry about that. Okay, so the first one is complexity. Um, and I've got another slide that we'll talk about this a great deal, but, but are, is our software so complex that unit testing is a problem? Uh, the next problem is uh, the fact that we deal with floating point arithmetic, and this is certainly something which is somewhat unique to the technical community. It's not, not necessarily just climate weather science, Certainly engineering has this issue as well, but large swaths of the commercial software engineer do not, engineering community do not face this issue. Distributed parallelism. This is, again, maybe not as unique to the technical community, community as it once was, but we, we have to deal with this with almost all of our code. And then there is this issue about scalability, since we're talking in an exascale um, series. Um, we want to be able to do testing of exascale software. And, and that poses some additional ch challenges to what we, how we use the tools and what we want those tools to do. I believe that almost all of these can be addressed or mitigated. Um, the, de the debate would probably be, do they mitigate them enough to make them practical? Um, there's two basic approaches. One is I'm going to argue that people generally write their software with too large of procedures. Um, you're, introductory computer science professor from college will be nodding his head saying, yes, yes, I told you, fit on one screen, back when the screens were 10 lines low. So the other one is mocks, and I'm going to have to explain to you what I mean by mocks, and so that's what we're going to do first. So a software mock, first, without the mock, we have a test, we have a thing we're testing, and then we have some complex dependency. So this thing is actually itself driving some very, very complicated layer down here. Um, in the textbooks, you'll usually see this being uh, represented as like a database that you're not really allowed to touch with your tests. But this could be anything that's very expensive or very complicated that makes it very hard to give inputs to the SUT that produce expected outputs. So what a mock is, is we create another layer that has the same interface of this complex dependency, or more precisely, the same interfaces that are actually exercised. If this has a lot of interfaces, our mock might only need those few interfaces that this that this uh, this this SUT exercises under this test. The test then configures this mock. It says, "I'm going to call you three times, or at least you should expect to be called three times. Here's the values that I expect for the inputs, and please check the following outputs." And so the test calls the SUT. The SUT then thinks that it's calling the real complex dependency over here. It's really just calling the mock which is you know, taking notes, being very big brotherish about what's going on, and then the test comes back and queries the mock at the end saying, well, did the SUT do the thing to you that he was supposed to have done? And so this sounds a little bit complicated, but in reality, there's a nice little, you know, there's a lot of different tools that do this out there. They're, they're, they, they give very, very straightforward ways to do this. They become harder and harder as your test gets more and more complicated, but, but this does work. Um, so an example motivated from, from my area of work, and this, this goes to some of the confusion that I see some of the scientists sometimes have. Suppose I wanted to test the coupler of my atmosphere and my ocean. Okay, so this is really the full climate model. What it does is it has, it, it has inside of it a time loop. It does some initial conditions. It does a, time, does a time loop where it iteratively calls back and forth between the atmosphere, the ocean, and it sends data back and forth between the, and both of them, and then it writes some outputs. That's a very oversimplified way to think of a model, but to some degree, this is what they all look like. There's some sort of cap layer on top that calls these pieces. Okay, so what would, what would mock mean in this context? Well, actually, before I even say that, what I want to say is, what are we really trying to test in this layer? This is very hard to provide synthetic inputs for a full climate model where we know what the output should be. There's just too much nonlinear, too much strong coupling going on for anything other than useless trivial inputs. But that's not what we're really trying to test. What we're trying to test here is to make sure that this coupler is sending the right data back and forth between the two layers. So when we want to test this layer, what we would actually do is create a mock atmosphere 
and a mock ocean. And what does the mock atmosphere do? It provides wind stresses. The test tells it what wind stresses to provide. And it expects some surface temperatures coming back from this coupler. Meanwhile, the mock ocean provides some surface temperatures and expects certain wind stresses. And so the test calls the atmosphere and has fed this extra little bit of information in here. And the atmosphere provides exactly what the test provided. And that gets sent down to this mock ocean. And the ocean says, oh, I did get the wind stresses I expected. This sounds trivial, but that's all that this layer is really doing in this uh, simplified version of what I'm describing. So one of the first things we realize is when we're testing some of these layers, we need to remember we're only testing the logic of that layer, not all the things that um, it drives under its hood. OK. So in particular in this example, I had a colleague at GFDL that thought that it would be impossible to test a climate model because the test would have the same complexity as the climate model. And at the time, I couldn't immediately refute what he was saying. But afterwards, I thought, no, he's misunderstood. We test our software components in isolation. So the complexity of a system that has n components only grows as the order of n. But the complexity of a climate model that couples all of those things grows as some polynomial power of n. So, so they really do have very, very different complexity. And if we go to very, very fine grain, this difference becomes quite large. Um, and again, the approach, as I mentioned in the previous slide, that I think of dealing with something which you think of as irreducible complexity is to introduce mocks and test the pieces independently. I think more relevant, a lot of people have come to me with this issue, and I, and I agree that this is an issue. Lack of analytic solutions. Lack of analytic solutions. Lots of algorithms out there, the only cases for which we know the answer are very, very trivial and don't really exercise the logic. What I have found when it comes to testing such things, though, is that it really corresponds that you're trying to test that whole analytic solution in one go. And we can break that up. So if you can split that up into multiple pieces, remember, we're checking the software. We're not validating the software. We can break into pieces, test those pieces, and now their solution is, is obvious. We can break it down into small enough pieces. We know exactly what those pieces should do. And then the pieces that bring those together, all that they're doing is, is connecting things. And so we test that the connections happen correctly. And we've now tested the whole thing. Now, one of the things that happens when you've done this, though, is you can make the whole thing run slowly. You've implemented these very, very small subroutines with lots and lots of overhead calling them together. And so the way, what you can do is you can then bootstrap. And so you take this very fine-grained implementation and use it as the test for the fused implementation. So you use fine-grained test to test the fine-grained implementation, use the built-up fine-grained implementation as a whole to test the ultimate solution you actually want to run in practice. And I have done this. It's, it's tedious. You only want to do it when you're actually concerned at a level that justifies it, but this does work. All right, even more common is we deal with inexact arithmetic. Almost all of my assertions outside of software infrastructure involve floating point results, and generally we need to specify some sort of tolerance. And estimating a tolerance is a problem. If you make it too small, then your, a correct implementation fails the test. Annoyingly, you know, it'll work on one operating system, you go to another operating system, and the tolerance changed just a little bit, and now it failed. All right. If it's too loose, then something that's broken passes your test, and you don't know about it. And even when you actually have a good estimate for the bounds, it usually isn't useful for unit testing. So the canonical example I have here is Runga Kuda, fourth order, has an error bound that goes as the fifth power of the step size. But that leading coefficient is impossible to use in practice. What, if you go look at the limitations, it's like the maximum value that the nth derivative of this function takes on within this domain, but you don't know what all domain it might cover. So, and nobody really has applied mathematician laying around for all the cases for which there aren't already known results. And so your temptation, oh, sorry, your temptation is to just increase the tolerance until the test passes, and I'm guilty of this myself. You don't want to do this. Um, this basically is making an assumption that the set is already correct. But oftentimes, by choosing synthetic inputs, don't choose obscure floating point values. Choose floating point value of 1 and 3 and 5. You can also oftentimes arrange it so that either the floating point arithmetic corresponds to exact integer arithmetic, or that the only roundoffs you're getting are just machine epsilon. So let's think about that a little bit more. What causes the roundoff? Well, one thing is subtraction of nearly equal values. And the other thing, and there's things like that, but that's sort of the canonical example in that category. 
And then there's iterated operations. Something only produces a small round off in one step, but by doing it over and over again, it grows exponentially. So the first mitigation is to use smart input values so that you actually don't subtract nearly equal values. Subtract things that are quite different. Again, we're not doing physics here. We're doing testing of the software. Um, and I've got a trivial example on the next slide that sort of um, demonstrates how this works. And we can split complicated expressions into pieces. And each of those pieces, we can use synthetic values to make sure that those pieces are done implemented correctly. And then we, and we, then we use those sub-expressions, initial values for those that we compose. And again, the example in the next slide is going to show how that works. And then finally, we take an iterated calculation. We split that into two levels of testing. One, we test what one iteration should do, and that doesn't have big round off. And then when we test iteration itself, we're not looking at floating point values anymore. When we test iteration itself, we're testing to make sure that the iteration happened the right number of times and that it jumped out of the iteration under the right conditions, not that it produced correct results. That's validation. Okay, so here the, the ref, reference here is to the Indiana Pie Bill. Um, this is something that nearly actually happened. This is the 19th century a traveling salesman with a uh, textbooks for math tried to convince the Indiana legislature to adopt his books for all of their curriculum. And it had a definition of pi, which is bad. In fact, it had many different definitions of pi if you actually work through what he was saying. They almost passed it. Apparently, during a lunch break, one of the legislatures came back and was made aware of this. And he himself was a mathematician and managed to kill it all. So this never actually passed. Um, anyway, that's, that's sort of the background for this example. But let's consider what happens here with a very simple thing. Suppose somebody told you to write a code to calculate the area of a circle and also make sure that you test it. Now, this example is too simple. You wouldn't need to write a test for it, but it, it shows what I'm talking about here, and everybody understands the example, so it's easy to see what's going on. So here's two tests you might write. The first one I would say, well, for a radius of 1, I expect 3.14159265, which is the number of digits that I have memorized now. If you had asked me this when I was a graduate student, I could have rattled off a few more. That's not enough tests. One is sort of a special case. You know, squaring it doesn't do anything. Let's make sure we really did square it. So let's try r equals 2. Well, at this point, I don't know 4 pi off the top of my head. I could cheat and put 4 times here, but that's not really. Then I'm duplicating logic. That's tautological. So I went to my calculator and actually calculated 4 pi and then typed it in here. Okay. One immediate problem is this test is not obvious. Somebody comes along and says, oh, I think he put a typo in that value. Very few people have 4 pi memorized to more than two digits. And a more realistic example, of course, no one would have an idea of what's going on here. So how can we avoid this and avoid floating point complexity in general, not just round off? All right, the idea here is let's split calculation of pi into two pieces in a way you would otherwise never do. So we take this initial implementation of area and create a helper function called area internal. And instead of taking one parameter, the radius, it takes two. The first parameter is the value of pi. And that sounds silly, but it's just what we're going to do. And so the area of the, computed by this is pi r squared for any given value of pi. And then our actual area function actually calls this first function using the actual value of pi. So now we can test this at two different levels. So let's come down and these first two assertions are testing that first level. We pass in a pi of 3 and check to make sure that for radius equal 1, we get 3. And for pi of 3, radius equal 2, we get 12. This test is now obvious. Anybody looking at this say, well, yeah, if pi was 3, that's the right answer. And then if we're really paranoid, we could also still do the final step saying, okay, but I'm not sure the actual area was using the real value of pi. So let's test this. So how do we test this? We use our existing implementation, area internal, with pi equal actual pi now r equal 2, and compare that to area r equals 2. And these should be exact to, you know, maybe if you have optimization on, you might get some round off at this point. But they should be essentially exactly equal. So you might need to put tolerance equals epsilon. In this particular case, um, I suspect it will pass. There's no optimizations to be done. And this will pass even with an exact zero tolerance. OK, distributed parallelism. There's a trivial aspect of this that's already been addressed. Uh, we need to be able to run the tests on multiple processes. We need to know which processes failed. We need to be able to write assertions that are blocking things like this. Th those are uninteresting in this context. The real challenges are real MPI code can have race conditions. It can have deadlocks. It can have live locks. And you want to make sure that your logic doesn't lead to that. And you can't rely on a simple test to make sure that this never happens in your code. First of all, your test is probably running on fewer processes. 
It's not running after something else happened that might have introduced some load imbalance in the system. And it might just be some very rare, very subtle timing event that you're just not capturing there. So this, this is a little bit harder. And this, this suggestion, um, actually, he, he suggested in a different context, um, a guy named Hal Finkel at Argonne, um, talking to me about where PFU unit could go, suggested that what we want is a layer that mocks MPI. And I've got a picture of this in a moment. But the idea is that we have a layer which has the same interfaces as MPI. But don't think of it as a stub. A lot of people are familiar with MPI stubs. This is very different. This is something we can configure. And we can tell that layer, oh, the first time this procedure is called, it should receive this value as an input. And when that does, produce this value as an output. And we can give a whole list of things that we expect it to see for that test. We then run our test. What happens now? Now we have a serial process that thinks that it is exercising MPI, but instead it's getting MPI signals back that we prearranged. Remember, we're not testing MPI, we're testing our layer that uses MPI. Okay? So a, a very concrete example, I've actually used this and it was, it was very rewarding. I, a few years back, needed to implement a mutex. And those of you that don't use MPI heavily might be a little bit surprised. MPI does have something called locks but they don't really let you do something where you can guarantee, like, what I want to do is I wanted one process at a time to have access to a file. And there's publications out there that tell you how to do this, but it's not, it's not trivial. It's not the hardest code in the world, but it's, it's certainly not trivial to write. And you have to worry about a lot of different cases. So I might request a mutex, and none of the other processes have one right now, in which case I should get it. Or I might request a mutex, but someone else should have it, in which case then I shouldn't get it right away, but I should get it when they release it. And if I release a mutex and there's nobody else waiting, then I don't do anything. But if there is somebody waiting, then I've got to give it to them. So there's lots of these scenarios, and they can be very hard to arrange if I'm using the actual MPI, because now I have to arrange one process has done something and not gone on and do, done anything else while I get this other process waiting for that signal. And so by using a mock, I was able to very, very precisely verify that all these things about my logic worked well. And then I'm only relying on MPI having a correct implementation. Well, MPI is more reliable than my own software, so generally that's pretty good. All right, so the picture here is the, the canonical example. I didn't want to steal other people's artwork. You probably have heard of brain in a vat, and this is a philosophical conundrum. All that you really know about objective reality is what you receive through your senses. So for all that you really know is you're a brain floating in a vat with electrodes attached to it, hooked up to television cameras and microphones, and so forth and so on, that's feeding your brain these inputs, making you think that you're sitting in front of a screen watching me talk, and so forth and so on. We're sort of doing the same game now here with the process. This Unix process thinks that it's running on a cluster with lots of other MPI processes. But since its only interface to that environment is through this MPI library, we can inject our own mock MPI library and fake it. And that's what we're doing here, and we're using that in order to make it so that we can refine our ability to test that layer. All right. Very, very similar to that, but with a different emphasis. Um, we want to be able to test things at Exascale. Uh, this is actually the context in which Hal Finkel had suggested mock MPI. Uh, some defects only happen at extreme scale. We'd love for them to show up when we're doing our smaller tests, but despite our best efforts, something different happens at extreme scale. Sometimes we're breaking somebody else's layer. Sometimes we just couldn't push the parameter regime to the point where we're actually exercising some of the logic. Oftentimes, it's very, very subtle what's going on. This can be very expensive. So now we've got, we, our group knows there's a problem. We don't know what it is yet. So we've got to wait for our chance to get access to a large number of nodes again, run our tests, uh, sorry, run our application, hopefully in the debugger, see what's going on, figure it out, and fix it. And once we fixed it, you know, how do we make sure that somebody doesn't put a patch in later on that breaks it that way again? Um, and my response to this is, again, we would use mock MPI. Now, this would be a hard context. It assumes that you at least know where the bug is. But once you know where the bug is, you can write a unit test that covers that layer of the software. You could configure a mock MPI so that it arranges the circumstances that you are seeing, and then you can make sure that your fix for that code then does work in that context, all on a serial process. Now, in some cases, you might need an entire node instead of a process. You might have a bug that shows up related to memory consumption on a node. So that would be a slight variant. Instead of now one process seeing a cluster, you now have a small group of processes on a node seeing a cluster. And so that's sort of where um, I want to end again. It's the same picture. Um, 
Mock MPI does not exist for me. I will not be at all surprised if somebody comes and tells me that there is a full Python mock. Certainly Python would be very straightforward to create a mock that way. I won't be surprised if somebody comes and tells me that this is C++ mock. If there is a Fortran mock, I'd love to know about it. Um, I'd probably still write my own just so I could use it with PFUnit. I've got little steps along the way, um, but I've never really had the time and it's not really a priority because of one other thing I should have mentioned earlier. Even when you're testing MPI software, most of your tests are serial tests. Often the stuff you're doing is just around the vicinity of MPI. We don't have a lot of logic in our code that does halo updates. We have a lot of logic that uses halo updates. So, so there's, 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 that's a little bit surprising. Even in a highly parallel code, most of your tests are not parallel. But nonetheless, this is something I would like to implement, or if somebody would like to implement it, uh, if somebody has a good intern that they'd like to point me at, um, I might be able to arrange funding for an intern to come out and work with me to do this over the summer. Um, Anyway, so that, that's where I'm at with that and where I'd like to go. And thank you. Uh, more questions? Hey, Tom, thank you. Uh, I think that there are some um, more questions in the Google Doc, but I think at this point where we are on time, sure. we should probably just uh, uh, try to answer these offline and send them as part of this transcript. No problem. Yeah, so I'll send the, the PDF file to, uh, to, to to folks. Okay, I'll try to get everything answered. Get this afternoon while it's still uh, fresh in my mind. So uh, hopefully, oh, great. It soon. Okay. Yes, we had a more we had more than thirty people staying with us for the extra time. Excellent. Uh, that was thank you very much, uh, folks. <laughs> that was great. And thank you, Tom. We'll be talking uh, offline. Okay. Right, thank cheers. you, Tom. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ashley. Bye.